Welcome to the Gentleman's Guide to Vampires. Today we shall be focusing on the Nagaraja, a very odd and obscure bloodline who may even defy the term vampiric. You see, the genesis of the Nagaraja is neither obvious, well, to us or to members of that bloodline. Not one Nagaraja that I have spoken to, and I have spoken to a couple, has been entirely sure of where they originate, and indeed, if you ask some, the most mundane answer seems to be that Giovanni was passing through India or somewhere else in Southeast Asia and happened to embrace a death cultist. And this death cultist was so obsessed, so racked with the need to experience oblivion that an aberration of blood created him as one of the Nagaraja. Now, I don't particularly like that theory. Another theory purports that a group of mages alchemically induced the embrace, so no vampire was required to create the first Nagaraja, and therefore we must ask, are they beholden to the same generational limits that the rest of the kindred are? Perhaps another more elaborate explanation is that a tradition of mages known as the Chakravanti, known as members of the Euthanatos arrangement of mages, were studying oblivion, studying the thread of life, the tapestry, the fates, and became so embroiled in entropy, in oblivion, in the need to destroy all, that maybe they did alchemically induce the embrace. Maybe they seized an aged Cappadocian and experimented with his blood. Perhaps they tried to duplicate what the Tremere achieved with the Azimisi and later through their diablerie of the Salubri. But what is known is that Nagaraja emerged. And depending on who you ask, perhaps they have been around for millennia, perhaps they have been around only for some small centuries. It is difficult to know for sure because, almost to a man, the Nagaraja, upon becoming vampires, disappeared into the underworld, the Shadowlands, across the gauntlet, to a shadow version of our own reality. Now, what were they doing there? The Nagaraja, again are elusive with their explanations, but my theory, and from what I understand from my contacts, is that they were members of a sect known as the Talmaheira, or True Black Hand. They were obsessives over bringing the antediluvians back to life, or essentially waking them up from their torpid slumbers, so that the antediluvians could wipe out all of the naysayers, all of those vampires that railed against them, and reward those who were loyal. After all, the Nagaraja saw this as the natural end of the world. They wished to bring about Gehenna, and to do so, they wanted the strongest vampires on their side, not just the Antediluvians, but Cain himself, and from the underworld, where they had the underworld versions of these torpid vampires, at least four Antediluvians, it is said, that they possessed the bodies of. It's possible that the Nagaraja were onto something. They were aligned with various other clans in this preposterous endeavour, and it can't truly really be said whether they were unsuccessful, for a great tempest roiled, or maelstrom rather, roiled through the Shadowlands and obliterated most of their bases, at least as far as I know. And this has driven the Nagaraja into a position of weakness. You see, they can no longer retreat to the underworld safely. All the spectres and spirits that they have harassed over the years are now hungry for their souls. And the reason they are hungry for Nagaraja in particular is because Nagaraja devour souls. Not in the way that a Nasamite might commit diablerie and uh, consume your soul in so doing. No, the Nagaraja have a more interesting way of doing this. They can not only commune with the undead of the Shadowlands, but they can also consume the undead of the Shadowlands. They can eat spirits and use that ectoplasm or use that soul stuff to power their disciplines, to give themselves their blood buffs, to give themselves a flush, a blush of life. They still require blood to wake with morning freshness, but they can subsist largely off of the soul stuff of spirits. They will consume the very nearly departed. If that doesn't paint a horrific picture in your mind, perhaps I will be more visceral. 
The Naganraja clan weakness, and this is perhaps what separates them from all other vampires in the extreme, is partly their teeth. You see, when a Naganraja becomes a Nagaraja, when a human is embraced by a Nagaraja and becomes one of this bizarre bloodline, the teeth are replaced by jagged row upon row of maw stretching back into the mouth, like a shark's mouth, all the better for chewing and tearing flesh from bone. Why would the Nagaraja need this? Well, the Nagaraja cannot subsist off of just drinking blood. They are not like any other vampire clan or bloodline. They need to consume flesh. One Nagaraja I met once by the name of Monique in Middle England. Now, Monique was a difficult vampire to track down, but it was worth doing. And in order to find her, a Tremere associate of mine told me, Oh, you know that run-down old place on Baker Avenue? Yeah? Well, try and ignore the smells and the sights in there and take along a mortal that you don't like very much and you might get some of the answers that you want from Monique. And so I did. And what's beheld, what I beheld, was more horrifying than any of the worst Sabbat revelries I've ever witnessed. Monique consumed my offering, my sacrifice. And in so doing, she also made love with him. She called it making love. I call it the most horrific sight I have ever witnessed. She rode her victim in order to take the sting out of what she was doing, which was cannibalising his body as she had sex with him. Can you imagine anything so terrible? He was begging for mercy. He was begging to be let free as she took great big gobbets out of his arm, out of his neck, out of his chest, his stomach, his legs. And all the time, she engaged him in some kind of sexual practice, which she seemed to take as incredibly erotic. She leaked a vitae from a place... <laughs> well... Clearly she enjoyed herself. Her victim did not. He died. Horrifically so. But Monique was able to furnish me with some answers. She explained something about the Nagaraja's particular gifts, that as well as having the vampiric disciplines of all specs and dominate, innate to them, much like the Tremere, interestingly enough, the Nagaraja are also versed in a discipline known as nihilistics, or nihilistics. They are capable of not just viewing how long a mortal has left before he dies, just by staring at his soul, but are also capable of, well, bellowing and screaming and emitting the shadow stuff of the abyss. Not of tenebration, no, they are able to emit oblivion from their mouths. They just retch, and out it comes. And it sticks to a victim like a magnet. And this magnet draws spectres from across the gauntlet. And those spectres not only harass the victim, but will drag him, kicking and screaming, back to the underworld. And it is the most terrifying thing you have ever seen, I can assure you of that. These nihilistics are a discipline unlike any other. And yet, when I met... Another member of the Nagaraja, Le Din Tho, of Vietnamese extraction. He was a very large man, large vampire, and would often rub his belly and proclaim how hungry he was. Now, at least in Monique's case, with her preying upon her victim and eating a pound of flesh for every pint of blood that one of us would usually consume, Le Din Tho had a different more macabre way of feeding. He surrounded himself with ghouls, and his ghouls loved him, were addicted to him, like druggies, not just to the drug, but to the pusher themselves, and they would wait for him to pat his stomach to signify his hunger, at which point they would crowd around him. This cavalcade of ghouls would fall to their knees and beg to be eaten from, 
Some would hold up dismembered arms, some would hold up their legs and beg to be chowed down upon. Some of them had already succumbed to his hungers before and were lacking the lower half of a left leg, let's say, or a great chunk out of one of their sides was missing. He had a troop, a cult of followers who were happy to feed themselves to him because for whatever reason they thought this granted them pleasure or immortality or something along that terrible vein and Lady Tho loved it. He loved displaying this in front of me. When he did so he assured me that nihilistics was not actually a discipline of its own right, it was a path of necromancy. It was the vitreous path, in his words, and very different from any of the paths practiced by the aberrant Giovanni, as he referred to them. Leontho explained that it was by choice that he was not in the underworld, and in fact in a Camarilla city. He said that the masquerade did the Nagaraja many favours, but they had to move around often. The Nagaraja cannot stay in one place for long because, unlike most vampires who can feed from a vessel and toss it aside as if it were nothing, the Nagaraja finds that more difficult given their need to consume flesh. It often does not leave their prey alive unless they have some particularly ingenious way of doing so. Leiden Tho made his haven in a morgue and it was very much out of the way. It was most horrifying place you have ever seen. The bodies in there still smiling, just hanging there waiting to be fed from, and he was feeding more than he ever needed to. He was feeding more. He was doing what we would consider gorging on blood, but he was doing it on flesh, and this flesh was turning into something else within him, turning into power, liquid power, that he was able to channel into his vitreous path. It was soon after that that Lady Tho explained that he can feed from other vampires in a similar way, that for a Nagaraja to diabolize a vampire, they have to consume the entire body pound for pound. I made a hasty retreat from his haven soon after. The ever memorable point of the Nagaraja is that they are not Camarilla and they are not Sabat, they are not Anarchs. While they will use the Masquerade to protect their own interests, they will not get involved in the Jihad. While they may well be bloodthirsty monsters, they are not members of the Sabats because they want to raise the Antediluvians while the Sabat wish to destroy them. The Nagaraja are truly alone, and perhaps that is why they have supposedly aligned with the Cathayans of Korea, or that is one tale at any rate. There are certainly a fewer number in these nights than they were before, but still they are more noticeable because they are not always hiding in the Shadowlands. Have all of their plans been scuppered by the maelstrom that broke through Enoch and destroyed their four antediluvians that they had safely torpid? Or perhaps they have another plan, because none of the Nagaraja I have met have ever seemed particularly perturbed at their discovery. None of them have seemed particularly unnerved that their plans have gone awry. Perhaps they adapt well. Perhaps they are like the cockroaches or rats of the vampiric world. The Nagaraja are truly dangerous to kindred and kine alike, for they eat you. They consume you pound by pound, and they have no concept of mercy. They feel no guilt or remorse, for this is no different than it is to us to drink a drop of blood, or to the kine to have a glass of wine. They need to consume flesh, and so they quickly put aside any angst that they might have over doing so. They consume flesh from bodies and souls from spirits. Is there any bloodline more monstrous than that?